Thank you all for being here today. Uh, we are very excited. This is our inaugural conference, and uh, so far, so good. We think uh, things are going well. I hope you think so, too. Hope you've learned something. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm here to introduce Dr. Jason White. I'm Craig Irwin. I teach business here at Eastern. I'm here to introduce Dr. White. Dr. White looks surprisingly youthful. Uh, based on all he's accomplished, I figured he had to be several hundred years old. Dr. White earned a bachelor's degree in environmental science from Juniata College, a master's degree and a PhD in environmental toxicology from Cornell University. Dr. White is the director of the Con Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station in New Haven, Connecticut, the oldest agricultural experiment station in the country, which means he must manage a $13 million budget, about 105 scientific staff, and a research program of $5.1 million. Before becoming a director, Dr. White served as assistant and associate agricultural scientist, agricultural scientist, head chief scientist, and vice director at the Agricultural Experiment Station. Dr. White is also a visiting scientist at Harvard University, an adjunct at Stockbridge School of Agriculture, and an adjunct at the University of Texas, El Paso. Dr. White authored or co-authored hundreds of published academic papers in addition to a number of book chapters and a book. Dr. White is engaged in a wide variety of professional activities. He's the managing editor of the International Journal of Photo Remedi Phyto Remediation. That's tough for a business person, that word. Um, he he uh, is serving or has served on the boards of various other uh, prestigious journals. Dr. White has expertise on the use of nanotechnology and agriculture and the sustainable use of micronutrients to suppress crop disease, increase tolerance to abi abiotic stress, and enhance food production. His expertise al also extends to the detection of pesticides, toxins, poisons, and heavy metals for food safety and food defense. Dr. White also has expertise in the remediation of persistent organic pollutants, such as PFAS, in soil, as well as more generally on the fate of organic contaminants in soils, sediments, and waters. In short, Dr. White has accomplished just about everything a scientist can accomplish, with the exception of climbing Mount Everest, but he, he let me know that that's in the planning stages right now. The, uh, the title of Dr. White's lecture is The Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, 147 Years of Consumer Product Safety. 147 years. I knew he was older than uh, he looks. Please give Dr. White a warm welcome. Wow, that, that was quite the introduction. Um, so I actually started at the Agricultural Experiment Station, which I'm going to tell you all about. Uh, I started as a postdoc uh, in 1997. So you get points for not saying when I got my PhD. Uh, and I literally had a meeting that morning with my postdoctoral advisor and spent the afternoon looking for a new job. Uh, but obviously that didn't work out. Uh, here, here I sit. Um, so what I'd like to do today is, is talk to you about how the experiment station has gotten involved with cannabis. Uh, and, you know, it's a story of 10 or plus so years uh, of, of work. Uh, but I also um, have an ulterior motive, and I say this all, to all the young faces in the audience. Um, the experiment station is primarily a research institution, although we are a state government agency. Uh, and uh, we love to bring in uh, uh, interns for research some of which we pay, but we're a state agency, so uh, a lot of um, students will come in and do uh, just research projects uh, for credit. Um, we can do that with universities uh, or just to gain experience. So that's my entire, uh, that's the ulterior motive going through the, uh, the entire presentation. So the Ag Experiment Station, uh, as noted, it's, it's, the, it's the first agricultural experiment station uh, that was established in the country. Uh, the history behind it is there was a Yale University chemistry professor uh, at the time who went to Europe, uh, and Europe, specifically Germany and England at the time, had these agricultural experiment stations, which were these odd 
uh, institutions where uh, you know academically trained professionals interacted directly with growers, directly with farmers, uh, to help solve their problems. So he came back, Samuel Johnson, petitioned the Connecticut State Legislature for uh, an agricultural experiment station in Connecticut. They gave him $2,500, uh, which was the two-year budget. Uh, and we actually were established uh, on the campus of Wesleyan University in 1875 in Judd Hall, which I'm told is still there. Uh, I haven't been there uh, in some time. Uh, and we spent two years there, uh, and then they kicked us out uh, because they needed the space uh, for teaching labs. So then we uh, moved in 1877 uh, into New Haven uh, to Sheffield Hall, which is uh, Yale University right down Prospect Street from us. And we actually stayed there for five years. Uh, and then they kicked us out uh, because they needed the space. So we ended up in our current location in, in New Haven. Uh, and if you, you know, when people come to visit, they always assume that the GPS screwed them up because it's in the middle of a residential neighborhood. But when we moved there in 1875, and that, that's our original building, they actually put us uh, out with the farmers. There's, there was literally nothing there. I've got pictures of my office. It's just farm fields. Uh, so everything that's there, including Albertus Magnus College, kind of grew up around us. Uh, so our first program, and there were two people that were hired, uh, was actually uh, a consumer product safety program, and that was fertilizer analysis. Growers in the state in the 1860s and 70s were buying fertilizers, putting them on their crops, and killing their crops. Uh, so obviously what they were buying was not fertilizer. So our first program, a program that continues to this day now with FDA funding, uh, is uh, label um, um, label purity analysis, label claim uh, confirmation. Uh, so some of the other uh, points about the agency, we are state government. I should also mention that uh, every state in, in the United States has an agricultural experiment station. We are also the only one that's um, not part of a university. That original law actually said we had to be independent uh, so we could, we could never join a university. California was the second one. And every institution after us, they all became, the, the ag experiment stations all went to the land grant universities. Um, so all of my fellow directors are actually deans of colleges of agriculture. Uh, so uh, as a state agency, we're, we're relatively small. Our annual budget is, is uh, a little over $13.5 million the year that we're currently in. Uh, and, but only about 7.76 of that comes from the state. The rest is federal money. Uh, and a lot of that is research money. Uh, we have 41 or 42 PhD scientists, and a lot of them... Uh, you know, are basically doing jobs they would do at a university, uh, you know, a, a, an R1 school where they write grants and do research. Uh, but we also get what's called formula funds um, from um, the federal government through the Farm Bill. Uh, so although I am uh, commissioner level as the head of an agency, I'm not a political appointee, thankfully. Uh, so when the governor goes, I don't go, I stay. Uh, we're actually governed by a board of control. That's who I report to. The governor sits on that, but so do so other uh, rep representatives from three universities, obviously the commissioner of ag uh, and uh, two citizens. So as noted, our primary mission is research. Uh, and that research has extended far beyond agriculture. Uh, and obviously agriculture is still a, part, a big part of what we do, but we have programs in food safety, public health, uh, and the environment. Uh, and uh, I don't want to spend too much time talking about those, but, um, you know, we have both. Mo most of those are research-driven, although there's some, some regulatory and surveillance work in there as well. Uh, but because we are a state agency, we do have statutory or regulatory responsibilities, and some of those are listed there. The director of the experiment station, and I'm, I'm the 10th director, uh, is actually the chief plant health official. So we're in charge of inspecting all... Um, um, uh, crops that move into and out of the state uh, for pests and, uh, and invasive diseases and things of that sort. Uh, our analytical chemistry group, and we have two representatives from our analytical chemistry group there in the middle, Terry and Anuja, uh, two of our analysts. Uh, we have um, FDA-funded but state-mandated um, chemical analysis on food, uh, fertilizers, and some other products. Uh, we house the state beekeeper. Uh, and um, we do a USFS funded surveillance of forests for pests. Uh, and um, we also run the state's tick testing laboratory. We run the uh, mosquito borne disease testing laboratory. So, whenever you hear about West Nile and Eastern equine encephalitis, we're doing the testing. Uh, and those programs have both regulatory and research components. 
Uh, and the research components comes from the fact that we're part of a CDC center of excellence for vector-borne disease, so we get money from them for research. Uh, administratively, we have five departments listed there. I'll pick up the pace a little bit because this is probably pretty boring. Uh, and our total staff is, is around 100, but that includes uh, postdoctoral scientists who come in for research projects and then, and then leave to continue with their careers. Uh, we have four locations. This is our ma main location in New Haven. Um, and that's actually the chemistry building there. Uh, we have uh, three experimental farms located at, uh, across these, um, these places. Uh, our main farm is, uh, and where I'll show you pictures of our hemp uh, growing, is in Hamden. Uh, we also have uh, a research center, which is out near the Rhode Island line in Griswold, uh, where there's a 40-acre farm. Uh, and then um, just short of the airport up in Windsor, we have Valley Laboratory, where there's also a farm uh, but a staff of, of seven to eight people, mostly plant pathologists and entomologists. Uh, and um, we have, currently have a million and a half dollars to do the, redo the greenhouses in our main laboratory for research. Uh, and that groundbreaking should be in uh, February or March. We also have $26 million to redo that building uh, and expand it um, because that building was built in 19. 40 and it's about to fall over. So I mentioned our food and consumer product safety. This is the, the giant laundry list of a lot of the programs that, that happen in analytical chemistry. Um, the experiment station is, is uh, in, in, for certain um, matrices, we're the primary analytical laboratory. We're not the drinking water laboratory, that, that's the public health lab, but uh, a lot of things other than drinking water will come to us from other state or federal agencies. Uh, and, uh, so, and we also do environmental monitoring. So we're DEEP's primary laboratory. So we're the PCB testing laboratory. We're the state FIFR laboratory for pesticides. Uh, I mentioned feeds and fertilizers. We still do that program. We also work with agriculture on the, the, uh, the burgeoning seaweed um, industry that's, that's taking off. Uh, pesticides and adulteration in food. This is a program that we actually started back in the 1960s, but on around 2005 or so, FDA um, started funding it. So it's now FDA funded uh, and they funded us to get ISO accredited, which is going to be important because we're applying that to our, our cannabis work. Uh, but the, all of, we work with our state sister state agencies for sample collection. Uh, we do all of the uh, liquor control testing, uh, whether it's a new product that needs a license or if it's uh, an investigation or a fraud um, or an audit type of thing. Uh, and then I mentioned DEP. Um, so as part of this USD, US FDA program, um, this historically has supplied us with a lot of the analytical equipment we have in our laboratory uh, because we were part of a food defense network that was established after the terrorist attacks of 2001. Uh, that has expanded over the years to include human and animal food surveillance. Some of the things that we've been involved with over the years, melamine contamination, which was an issue in, you know, 2008 to 2010, both pet food and uh, baby food formula. Uh, we were one of three labs that were testing seafood from the 2010 Gulf uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Uh, and these are some of the things that we're still involved in. We do political convention testing from time to time as part of that food defense. Um, so there's a lot going on in the chemistry department, which I ran for about 11 years, which was, which was great. And some days I miss it and some days I don't, right? Um, so, um, so what's our 147-year history in, in consumer product safety? As I mentioned, it was initially focused on uh, fertilizers. Uh, and what we do is we obviously write a lot of peer-reviewed scientific publications, but we also write publications for the public, which we call bulletins or technical bulletins. Uh, and this is actually what our one, our one of our first ones looked like. This is the handwriting of Samuel Johnson. But it was an analysis of some of the fertilizers. Uh, and you can see some of these other ones over here. But we still, this was one that was published uh, earlier this year. Um, it was um, produce, or sorry, to, uh, to 2021. It, it was our pesticide and heavy metal analysis of our, our human and food, uh, human and animal food um, surveillance program. We went just from consumer product safety to food safety, specifically in 1895. There was a law that was passed that basically said, you guys got to do this. So we started doing it. Uh, and um, this eventually is what morphed into that market basket program and now is FDA funded. Uh, I just think it's kind of interesting to look at this historically. Um, the very first surveillance that was done was pretty robust. 
Uh, I don't know what the staff of the, the experiment station was uh, in 1895, but I know it wasn't 100 people. Uh, but they analyzed 848 food samples across you know, all of these categories, basically just looking for adulteration. Is what's supposed to be in there actually in there? Uh, and some products did pretty good. Maple syrup, only eight violations. Some products didn't do very good. Uh, coffee, um, you know, 64 samples analyzed and 58 of them were violations, meaning that they contained something other than coffee. So the Food Safety Modernization Act was passed uh, by Congress in 2011 and implemented in 2012. And one of the things that it said was that any state lab that's going to give data to the federal government, to the FDA, should really be ISO accredited. There was a little bit of wiggle language, a wiggle room in the language, but the intent was really that if you wanted FDA to act on your state's data, then you needed to be ISO accredited. Uh, and I remember the, and Terry was at that first meeting with me, uh, I don't know which one of us cried harder when we saw what was involved in becoming ISO accredited. That was 2012, I think. Uh, but, you know, the, the nice thing about this program was FDA actually gave us a lot of money to do this, and they're continuing to give us a, a lot of money. This year they gave us $600,000 to run these programs, uh, which pays for staff, equipment, and all, all sorts of things. Uh, so we started our accreditation journey for food safety programs in 2000 and uh, actually late 2011. We uh, and achieved our accreditation for those programs in 2016. We've maintained those and expanded, uh, including bringing uh, our hemp testing program, which is both THC and CBD, um, because there's several parts to being accredited. One is, you know, do you have the laboratory management system in, in place to do that? But the other is which methods are on your scope. Uh, so we added our, our hemp methods uh, in 2021, and uh, we're going to be the adult use uh, marijuana testing laboratory, and we'll be adding some of those methods to scope as well. So I think a lot of you know this, so I'll, I'll go through it quickly. This is just kind of the, the legal status of cannabis. I actually just put this up here because I wanted to show pictures of my two favorite presidents, right? Um, I just, I just thought it was funny that, you know, here we are in 1970 and everybody's smiling and laughing as we're, you know, outlawing uh, marijuana, putting it on the Controlled Substances Act. And then here's, here's our good friend, President Trump. He's uh, signing the Farm Bill in 2018, which is allowing, you know, hemp, hemp cultivation to, to really take off. And he looks pretty dour there. Um, <laughs> But anyway, here's the history, and uh, you know I've got some more details on this, and, I, and again, I think a lot of people know it, but there was the pilot program in 2014, and then in 2018 was when the, the Farm Bill um, really kind of let things take off, and there's the definition we're all familiar with, that 0.3% THC, uh, and in the one um, breakout session we had earlier, we were, you know, the, 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 and I guess Jerry talked about this last night, the, the kind of arbitrary nature of that number, but it is the number. Um, so uh, anything above that, obviously, is going to be considered marijuana. Um, and um, you know, most of the cannabis uh, that's grown in Connecticut uh, right now is actually for uh, its hemp for CBD. Uh, we hosted somebody from Belgium last week, uh, and they grow a ton of hemp um, in, in Belgium and in other countries in Europe. N very little of it's for CBD. Most of it's for fiber. And they, they have more seed than they know what to do with. Um, so it's interesting the, the differences. Um, so I think the last bullet on there was that um, uh, we, so the Department of Agriculture basically asked us, and they're a separate agency than, than we are, they asked us to be the hemp testing laboratory. So our initial uh, assignment was going to be as the regulatory testing laboratory for hemp in the state of Connecticut. So, you know, kind of taking a step back from, from that, um, you know, we can talk about the medical marijuana program that was signed into law by Governor Malloy. Uh, in June uh, 2012, uh, and we were involved in some of the early discussions. I remember um, the director, two directors before me, called me to a meeting uh, at the LOB, Legislative Office Building in Hartford, to, to have a meeting with some of the industry that was coming in for the, uh, at the time to, to set up some of the, the medical use um, institutions. Uh, and at the time, they were really interested in getting the state involved in running the testing program because there was two companies represented, and they had a lot of experience in other states where private laboratories, um, they, they, they were having trouble. As they were coming into Connecticut, they were seeing a large, large industry, and they were probably seeing legalization on the horizon, uh, and they really wanted state involvement in the program. Uh, and that wasn't going to be our call, but we met with them. 
the director at the time was super, super old school, we'll say, and traditional. Uh, he was shaking his head so hard, I thought it was going to fly off. But as I said, it wasn't our decision. The, the decision was made to, to allow a private testing laboratory industry to start. Uh, and, and that's what happened right now. There, are, there have been three laboratories that are testing as part of that program. Uh, UConn CIS is one of them, Center for Environmental Science and Engineering, Altasai, and Northeastern Labs are the, the labs that are doing the testing for that program. So we have had very little involvement. I mean, uh, you know, in, in 10 years, we've probably had a dozen samples, maybe less, of, you know, specific complaints or investigations. Um, that probably will change because I think one of the things that's going to happen is that uh, our involve, uh, involvement in the adult use testing program is going to bring with it more involvement in, in uh, medical. So uh, I could skip over a lot of this. There's our definition of hemp, but there's, there's a couple of things in that definition that are important for testing. Uh, and the, the first of which is that, um, you know, the, the testing procedure here has to um, have this post-decarboxylation -decarb method um, or, or step in it, which means, um, you know, t all they want is THC. So all the THCA has got to be converted. So testing-wise, there's a couple of ways you can do that. If you do a liquid chromatography method, which you can do, you end up with two peaks that you've got to add together. We decided, we being... Harry decided that that was going to be a pain in the neck. Why not just do a GCFID where you get that conversion automatically because of the high temperature? Uh, and then the other issue is, is that the dry weight isn't defined. Um, this isn't necessarily an issue for one lab doing testing because we dry everything the same way every time we test it. But if different labs are using different drying methods, then you can end up with different results because the result is based on a dry weight. Um, and we've actually kind of seen that. Uh, so, this plant probably looks familiar. Um, so, um, I just actually just put this up here um, just to show a couple of pictures. Uh, and, you know, I'll show some more pictures in a minute, but this is a picture from our farm. Uh, we have a large pollinator um, program, uh, and uh, we're actually hiring a scientist right now uh, in, into that. Um, so, this is one of the pictures we were showing off for uh, the pollinators that were being encouraged. Uh, so. Uh, one of the things that the Ag Experiment Station is really, really good at doing is taking regulatory programs and leveraging research, or taking research and leveraging regulatory programs, and that's what we've done in this case. So this is, uh, this is our Lockwood farm. It's a 74-acre farm in Hamden, Connecticut. And I don't know, this is probably the better part of half an acre, I think, of, of hemp cultivation. These are pictures from a couple of years ago, but we, we pretty much have hemp growing each year now. Uh, and I'll show you data from this field trial, but these were just five different cultivars that we were growing. Um, so uh, the interesting thing about this farm is 8.30 to 4.30 during weekdays, it's essentially a state park. The gates are open, people come in, they walk their dogs, they're moving all around. So we, um, you know, we were a little strategic in where we placed our hemp uh, plot. Uh, Quinnipiac University also sits across the street, so uh, you know, we didn't want it right at the fence's edge, so to speak. Um, but, you know, during the weekends and evenings, it's, it's a, a locked facility. So a few things on the chemical analysis. Um, this this kind of came up this morning in our, in our one group. Um, you know, a quick turnaround time is really, really important. And this is, this, I was just talking about this with Terry. I took over as director two years ago, so my, in, my direct involvement in hemp hasn't, hasn't been as, um, as significant as it was before then. Uh, but it, the, still, the, the quick turnaround time is important for hemp growers because it's a pre-harvest test. So the grower, and, and for the first few years, the growers could send in their own samples. Now it's, the ag has to come take the sample. Uh, but you, you know, once you take that pre-harvest sample, the clock starts ticking. Uh, and it's 30 days now for you to, take, take the, uh, to do the harvest. Um, so... Um, so this was an issue because uh, the original role for our laboratory was going to be the regulatory testing lab. So we were only going to test samples that DOAG wanted us to test for an audit or for an investigation or something. Uh, but the private labs that were doing the testing, they were having difficulty meeting the, the turnaround time because they were doing many other things, including medical marijuana testing. Uh, and um, so DOAG came and said, well, can you guys do consumer you do the grower testing as well, which we did. We accredited it, and now Terry can turn around a sample in 24 to 36 hours, uh, which is really important for the growers. As, as noted, it's a total Delta 9, so you've got to do the, the 
the decarboxylation. Boxylation somehow, um, we do it by the GCFID. So this is just a little bit on our methods. Uh, so the, the longest part of this is actually the drying. Uh, you've got to dry your plant material because the brought in is fresh, fresh material. Uh, and then we just do a simple methanol extraction, and by we, I mean Terry and Anuja, uh, and eject it on uh, GCFID uh, and get, get data within 10 minutes. We have a lot of quality assurance associated with that, ana that analysis because it is uh, a method on our scope. Uh, so uh, you know, the, the data analysis can take a lot longer than 10 minutes uh, to confirm that every, everything ran well, including we run these certified reference materials every run. We have a blank to make sure. So in this one, we get um, accuracy because we know what's in there. It's on the label. It's a certified reference material, so we can analyze it and make sure we're getting the number we're supposed to get. This is supposed to have zero, so we can make sure we have zero. We do everything in duplicate, so that gives us precision. Uh, and then we participate in PT programs, which is when somebody else sends us an unknown, we have to test it uh, and then see the number we get. So this is just showing it. And Terry's going to talk about this a little later, so I'll skip over it. But if you're running an accredited program, you really need procedures to assess accuracy and precision for every single analysis that you do. Uh, and this is how we do it. It's by something called control charting. Uh, so this is our certified reference material. Over time, every time we analyze it, we know what's supposed to be in there because it's a certified reference material, whether it's THC or CBD. Uh, we set um, boundaries. To, those, to that average value, we have a warning and then a, a fail. And so that every time we do an analysis, we plot this and we make sure that it falls within the guidelines. So this gives us our, our accuracy uh, data for, for both of these analytes. So if you know, something is off that day, it's going to show up in that number and we know we have to do an investigation and figure out what went wrong. This is what our reports look like, uh, and as noted earlier, UConn only gives you THC. What, is, what does the experiment station give you? They give you THC and CBD. Um, so, uh, and the other, the other thing that came up, and I was going to mention this earlier, but I'll, I'll, I'll point it out now, is this issue. So we report the average, but the farm bill uh, actually requires method uncertainty. So it's never just an average. It's always, you know, what's the error associated with that number? Uh, so, you know, it's 0.24%. Uh, but, you know, in reality, that number at 95% confidence could be anywhere between 0.12 and 0.336. So we use a 50% confidence interval, which is what we use for a lot of our other regulatory programs, including uh, work we do with the, the EPA and the FDA. Uh, you can define it tighter than that, but that's a good, good starting point. So this one's obviously a pass. This one's a fail because the average was 1.1%, uh, but the fail is actually determined by that the, the bottom uh, the bottom level of the range. So, you know, if this was 0.4, but this low range was 0.29, that's still considered a pass. It's not a fail until you're above 0.3%. So, as I said, um, in addition to being the hemp testing laboratory, and the benefit of being the hemp testing laboratory is it came with a general funded position, uh, and Terry. Uh, Terry's worked for the experiment station actually longer than I have, but mostly on soft money. So this was uh, enabled us to, uh, to put her on hard money, which is always good. But the other thing that we like to do is because we are primarily a research organization, what kind of research can we do uh, in support of, of this program? And there's a couple of research programs we have going, uh, but the first thing we always need to do is, you know, to, to develop methods, you need hemp to work with. So that's the initial reason why we started growing hemp at our Lockwood farm. Uh, but obviously, we wanted to do some research well, as well. So this is just a, a couple of slides from a study that um, Terry did uh, with a few others in 2020 uh, and wrote it up uh, and um, looked at eight different varieties at our Lockwood farm. Uh, and you can see kind of the details here, um, the growing details. This is just some, what some of the pictures look like. Uh, so, in, and another discussion that came up earlier was the different licenses you need, it, you need to do this. So even though we are a state agency and we are the, the state hemp testing regulatory laboratory, we had to get a hemp license from the Department of Agriculture to grow hemp at our farm. We have another project that's starting where we're going to grow hemp at our greenhouse, uh, and we had to add that to our, to our license. Uh, but these are just some of the pictures of plants that you all recognize. One of the things that I 
still find interesting is uh, the different phenotype, and we talked about this earlier, due to the, the kind of uh, genetic heterogeneity that still exists in a lot of these um, cultivars. You know, th these are two plants um, that are of the same seed, uh, and you know, morphologically, obviously, they look, they look tremendously different, and then compare it to this one back here. Um, so we talked about this earlier. You know, a lot of this is just, um, you know, there hasn't been enough time to, to create the um, genetic homogeneity in a lot of these. Uh, but what I'll show you in a minute is that this phenotypic morphology is also accompanied by a lot of biochemical and phytochemical differences, which can be problematic. Uh, we kind of had a problem during our field season because, remember, that was tropical storm, uh, and that damaged uh, quite a few of our plants. But, um, we were okay. Oh, here it is, insect damage. Uh, you know, the, the interesting thing is you're going to get completely different pests and pathogens inside than outside. So a lot of this is going to depend on where you're growing it. Uh, but um, our, uh, our two biggest ones outside were corn borer and corn earworm. I don't know if we saw any other um, insects of significance. And I don't think we saw powdery mildew. We don't get that. I've heard people talking about that as well. Um, but if you're growing indoor, you, you're not going to get these. You're going to get something else. Uh, and that's another place where we can help because, you know, we, we've got more plant pathologists than you can shake a stick at at our place, uh, and including a public uh, plant disease information office to, to address a lot of questions uh, about these types of things. So this is, this is some of the, uh, the data that came from that uh, study. Uh, and this is interesting because uh, Terry did this. So, you know, we, she was uh, harvesting from, uh, through August, from August to October and then tracking over time CBD uh, and THC uh, for, for the different cultivars. And these are just three of them that we're, they're showing here. Uh, but you can see how rapidly as you go through the end of August and in September how these spike. But it's also interesting how you see some of these major differences. So CBD is the dotted line, and that's the CBD axis. The THC is the solid line, and the THC axis is on the right. So you can, it's kind of, kind of complicated. But the point being, you can see for some cultivars, there's a lot of separation here, but they all basically are spiking at some point in the, in the late summer, which is kind of what we already know. This was really interesting because in this part of the study, Terry actually went out and instead of taking a bunch of samples of one cultivar and homogenizing it and blending it up and analyzing that a, co you know, a couple of times, she actually took 10 plants from each population, 10 from you know, a single cultivar, but analyzed them separately. Uh, and looked for CBD and THC, uh, and that's what you. And you know, the thing that jumps out here is just the, the plant to plant or individual to individual variability that you can see. Uh, and uh, you know, if you're growing and you're trying to figure out when you should harvest, um, you know, this type of data doesn't doesn't make you feel very well because not only do you have a lot of variability uh, in individual um, plants, but you know, you know, the analytes are varying significantly from one individual to the next. So I think this is a problem that will eventually go away as the seed sources become more reliable, as the genetics of the, of the, genetics of the cultivars become more homogeneous. Uh, but this is, this is clearly problematic right now. So some of the other research that we're doing uh, on cannabis. Uh, so we actually have a Fulbright scholar from Tunisia who's with us now. She's leaving at the end of November. Uh, and she wanted to use uh, the plant extract from cannabis to create nanoparticles. Uh, and why would you want to do that? Uh, well, we have a large initiative at the experiment station on applying nanotechnology to increase agricultural output. Uh, and, and, and a lot of that is increasing the efficiency of how you deliver pesticides and fertilizers. Um, you know, about 75 to 90 percent of the pesticide or fertilizer that any grower adds in the field never makes it to its source. Uh, so what we know about nanotechnology is that you can do things really, really precisely. It gives you a lot of control. Uh, and a lot of nanoparticles are chemically synthesized. But you can create nanoparticles of nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, micronutrients, potassium. Um, well, potassium is a macronutrient, but copper, manganese, and so forth. You can create those nanoscale versions of nutrients using plant material as you're reducing agents. Uh, and then you end up with a with a nano fertilizer at the end that has some pretty unique properties because it, it takes with it some of that phytochemistry. 
Uh, so she's actually writing this up as a paper right now um, because we actually found some really interesting results about how this uh, new nano fertilizer, we intended it as a nano fertilizer, but it actually ended up controlling uh, Fusarium, a fungal infection on soybean. So we have a research program in that area. Uh, we also have an NIH program, uh, a grant that was funded for PFAS. Uh, PFAS is an emerging soil contaminant, uh, and there's a lot of interest in finding out ways to um, uh, either get it out of the soil or to bind it in the soil so that it doesn't contaminate food. Uh, so there's a strategy called phytoremediation where you can use certain plants to actually suck contaminants out of the soil. Uh, so we, pr we actually had data sh with hemp showing that um, they, were, they were pretty good at doing this for PFAS. Uh, the preliminary data is actually coming from a field study we have in Maine um, with a, a tribe up there, the Mi'kmaq Nation. Uh, but it's not pulling out a lot. So um, this program, we're actually developing novel nanomaterials that are sustainable. They'll bind to the PFAS, and then the, the hemp will take the whole thing out, uh, the contaminant. Uh, so this is actually the, the, uh, the, the grant where we're going to start growing hemp in, in our greenhouses. And then that brings us to adult use uh, cannabis. Uh, so obviously this was passed uh, in July 1st of 2021. Um, I don't need to dwell on the specifics of the legislation. Uh, just to say that Department of Consumer Protection Drug Control approached us pretty early. Uh, and by pretty early, I mean mid-2020. Uh, and wanted us to be uh, involved as the, the state's regulatory testing laboratory for this. Uh, and at that point, I was in charge and I shook my head yes so hard it almost flew off uh, because it was going to come with additional positions and uh, we were already doing hemp uh, and um, you know it's just a really interesting system, system to work with. So as noted uh, adult use cannabis came with three new chemist positions. Why do I say that? Because if you're a state employee and you're running a state agency it's really 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 hard to get positions to hire new people. So cannabis has brought four in the last four years which is you know, four times as many as the preceding 10 years. So what's, what's the kind of adult use marijuana testing going to look like? Um, it's going to be hard. Um, you know, and Terry's probably going to throw something at me when I say this, but the hardest part of the hemp testing program, I think, is really the rapid turnaround time. I mean, um, you know, she's really good at her job, so she was able to stand up the program. But it's, it's plant material for two analytes, THC and CBD. So really the hardest part of that is turning it around really quickly for the grower. Um, adult use cannabis is going to be the exact opposite of that. Um, so we're going to have to s test uh, a whole series of cannabinoids, those listed there. Um, the, the statute also says that every product has to be tested for pesticides. Um, now we have an ISO accredited pesticide testing program for food and feed, so we can apply that to this program. Uh, they, it has to be tested for mycotoxins, five of them. Well, we've got four accredited, so we just need to add one, uh, but again, in different matrices. And also terpenoids, which we have to stand up a method for that, and also toxic metals. So every one of those groups of analytes is a different extraction or digestion, so different sample preparation procedure. Uh, these are all going to be either G, uh, LCUV or LC mass spec, so one set of instruments. Pesticides are another instrument, same instrument as mycotoxins, although different extraction method. And the metals are completely something else, and the terpenoids are completely something else. And all of that has to happen in every single matrix that comes in, which is not going to just be plant material. Um, so then I started thinking we should ask for 30 chemists, not three. Uh, but um, you know, so we're in a lot of so we're in a lot of discussions now with consumer protection drug control about the testing. I mean, do we really need to run pesticide screening panel on a pill uh, or you know some other some other product? Uh, and you know, we got to figure out what the answers to those questions should be. Uh, but that that's a lot of what's happening right now. But we will be the regulatory testing laboratory. So the only samples we are going to analyze will be ones submitted by Department of Con Consumer Protection Drug Control inspectors, whether it's surveillance, whether it's an investigation, uh, or we're going to also be the oversight laboratory for the other labs that are doing the testing, the private labs. 
Uh, and they did ask when they do their audits, when con drug control does their audits, they would like us to go with them to audit the private labs. Uh, so I'm running a little short on time. Um, so this is this is kind of what I said. I got ahead of myself, but the, the take-home message is, you know, lots of methods, lots of analytes, lots of matrices, and we'd like to accredit all of it. Um, you know, that's going to be a, a process that's going to take a very long time. And obviously, you know, not all of these analytes are of the same importance. I would argue. I mean, obviously, knowing the THC is going to be the, the most important thing. Uh, knowing the the cadmium concentration of a pill may be of less significance. So I will stop there. Uh, there's my contact information. As I said, you know, all of those programs that I mentioned, including the regulatory ones, we will, we will bring interns in and we will work with you and you will help us, which is why we like to do it, and also, you know, be part of the educational process, um, but both research and regulatory programs. So here's my contact information. I actually have to run and catch a flight out of Newark in about three hours, so I'm going to run out of here. But Terry and Anuja will be here for a little while as, as well. So happy to take any questions. Yes. I know that sounds silly, um, but I'm not sure everybody understands that if you purchase, say, a piece of equipment with federal funds, you're not allowed to use it, I believe test for cannabis, is that correct? So I'm going to repeat the question because I think we're recording and they probably yeah, couldn't yeah. hear us. Yeah, so. to do with if yeah. you purchase, say, a piece of equipment with USDA funds, let's say, are you allowed to or not allowed to use that piece of equipment to test for cannabis because it was federal funds? Right, so the, the question is, and this is for the recording, um, if you have federally funded equipment, can you use it for this type of testing? Uh, and I, I think that's a little bit of a gray area. That was actually a significant problem for us because up until 2020, all of, almost all of the analytical equipment in our laboratory was actually owned by the FDA. It had FDA property stickers on it because of they purchased it and we were using it for them. Uh, but in 2020, when the five-year grant cycled up, they actually transferred all the equipment to us. Uh, so it's not a problem for us, but it is a discussion that we've had, and I don't know that there's a, there's a good answer to it. Uh, I do know that UConn, Center for Environmental Science and Engineering, will not be doing adult use cannabis testing, and I believe that's because the university is concerned about the potential loss of federally fund, uh, a federal funding for, for doing that, that work. Um, so it's not going to be an issue for us because none of our equipment is federally purchased anymore or federally owned. Um, but it's it's a problem for states. Um, so for your GCMS analysis, what temperatures do you need? So do you need higher temperatures to be Yeah, so the question is for the, the GC FID analysis, what are the temperatures? Uh, the inlet temperature, I don't know, what is it, 290 degrees Celsius? 250 degrees Celsius. Uh, and that's that's just a function of the instrument. So, you know, so that's, that's what, why we chose that method, just because by virtue of in doing the injection, you get that step happening. The question is, have we accounted for any CBD that might be converting to THC because of that temperature? Uh, I mean, we're reporting out CBD and THC by, uh, in, for every single sample. Uh, and we're doing the certified reference material for the CBD every injection, and we're staying within our control limits. So it's possible less than 10% conversion could be happening, but you know we're, we're still meeting our QAQC. Because of proficiency testing and certified reference materials, where we hit the target. I mean, hit the target plus or minus 20%. So, but. Um, if, I'm not saying it's not possible it's happening, but I think it's negligible. Yeah, but we haven't done the LCUV comparison to look at that, which is what you would need to do. We are working on that. We are working on that. Yep. Can I ask about the phyto remediation? Sure. Um, where does the contaminated plant go? How do you dispose of that? That's an excellent question. The question is for the phyto remediation project, now that you've got uh, hemp, industrial hemp, the cheap stuff uh, that's loaded with PFAS, what do you do with it? Um, so 
Um, the, and so we're using the strategy that, that's used for fighter remediation of heavy metals, and there are some companies that actually can do this and make money off of it. But what you're doing is you're taking a large portion of land that is moderately contaminated, and you're pulling that contamination out, and you're getting it into a compartment, a plant, that you can deal with. You can pull it out. You can move it around. So um, the first thing that will happen will be it will be dried, which reduces the mass by 90 percent. Uh, and then um, in the case of PFAS, it would probably go to a hazardous waste landfill or an incinerator. That being said, we're starting a collaboration with a group at Princeton, which has found some bacteria that can kind of attack PFAS molecules. Um, so there's multiple strategies. You can figure out the enzymes and see if there's something analogous in plants. Uh, but all that's really, really at the research stage right now. Um, you know, we've got data from this field site in Maine where the Micmac Nation lives, because, and it's an old Air Force base next to a train, fire training school, and we showed that in one year we reduced the PFAS soil concentration by about 10%. That actually, there, there's a, um, you, they did that study, so, you know, that number has some quotations around it because it was, it was not designed as a, necessarily as a research experiment, uh, but the, the data is, is fairly impressive. Yep. So Connecticut, uh, UConn's not going to participate in the adult use testing for cannabis? I, I probably shouldn't speak for UConn. Uh, yeah, but my, 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 so UConn, uh, the Center for Environmental Science and Engineering, um, they're, they're a great group. We work with them on multiple programs over the years. And they are doing medical marijuana testing. Uh, the last time I talked to them, which was prob about this, which was probably almost a year ago, was that they were not going to get involved and that the reason was concern over federal funding to the university, which is a lot. So if you have an oversight control that leaves two testing centers, I mean, we all know the adult use market is going to have an exponential growth and samples need to be tested. And you know, I'm sure cultivators are going to have concerns of a bottleneck. Have you talked to DCP about, you know, addressing the potential bottlenecks down the road and how we can mitigate that? I know that, well, I know there's at least two new labs coming in um, to set up testing. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not sure what the, I'm not even sure what our sample load is going to be. Um, I mean, so if you're concerned about yours, just imagine these guys on a scale serving the whole state that's about to blow up next year. I'm sure there's going to be. Right. I, I know they're aware of the issue. Um, but, um, you know, one of the problems is going to be because it's still a federally banned substance, substance you can't send your sample out of state for analysis. Um, so it's really got to happen in state. Um, if, if they called me and asked us if we could start just doing grower samples, I, I'm not sure we could because we, we yeah, well, it's a lot of work. And, and as noted on slide number one, we still, of our $13.5 million budget, you know, $4 million of it's federal. Uh, and that's all staff. I mean, if we lose that, we're in trouble. So I, that would take, I would serious, I would significantly want to help people that are in this growing industry. Uh, but we would need to talk to the Attorney General's office to see if it's even possible. And then, and then it becomes an issue of staff and resources and all of that. So. Any other questions? All right. I hope lunch was good. I'm going to eat it in my car on the way to the airport. <laughs>